I didn't have any moment of cognitive rest, which is something that I would go back and redo in a moment. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm Dr. Chris Nowinski, co-founder and CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Welcome to episode six of the Concussion Game Plan podcast. As we wind down season one of the podcast, we're ready to tackle one of the most difficult aspects of the concussion recovery journey, returning to school or work. You're going to love our guest for this episode. Dr. Brenda Egan Johnson specializes in helping children, teens, and young adults return to school after concussion. She shares some awesome advice on how parents can best support their student with a concussion. We'll also hear from Juliana Kalia. Juliana is a Boston University graduate who has suffered multiple concussions. In this episode, Juliana shares how she navigated returning to the classroom and office after a concussion. She shares her tips for managing the recovery process, best practices for how to communicate concussion limitations with teachers and employers, and what she wishes she had done differently in her recovery. Let's head to the slopes to hear about her concussion experience. I was on the ski mountain on a very icy slope, and unfortunately, uh, hit, an, I hit an object that I didn't see and was ejected from my skis headfirst into the ice. Um, immediately after, I was far more concerned about my wrists than my head, even though my head had fit the ice first. And it wasn't until about an hour later where I started to feel really nauseous when I was skiing, really clouded. Um, again, the, there was no obvious pain and I felt that I was safe because I had a helmet on. So. It wasn't until actually the next day I went to class. I was in a lab and I actually left and I vomited. And in that moment, I immediately sought out, I sought out student health services and um, was diagnosed with a concussion. In the first week, the, the nausea kind of gave way to the headaches. I felt really jarring migraines, unlike a normal headache that I might feel when I was sick especially when I was outside and out and about walking to a classroom or walking to the store. And I was also extremely um, just feeling very clouded over. And the, the final symptom I think really affected me is I couldn't see well at all. So I was, everything was double for that first week. I think the first week I was under the impression that it would go away on its own because I've had experiences with concussions before where that was the path of recovery, luckily. And so I went through a week of class without really having any um, learning happening. Generally, medical providers, the healthcare providers say a, a student should be off school for no more than one to two days. And that's often the recommendation. And then the students return to school. Dr. Brenda Egan Johnson is the Brain Steps Project Director for a Brain Injury School Reentry Consulting Program. She's based in Pennsylvania and has 15 years of experience in the field. She helps children and their families in schools after brain injury. We know it's so important to have students go back to school within one to two days, as long as the school is ready to support the student with academic supports. Because the longer a student is out of school, you know, the literature is telling us now that they're experiencing, if they're pulled from their friends, from their screen time, for long periods of time, they're experiencing social isolation, anxiety, depression, panic disorders, even suicidal ideation. So keeping an eye out for that. We, we ask all school psychologists, all school nurses, at four weeks, if a student has not recovered from their concussion, do a quick screening for depression and anxiety. Some students may simply be too symptomatic to return to school two days after the injury and may require additional time. Regardless of their timeline to return, Dr. Egan Johnson advises parents to involve their school as soon as possible. Parents and schools need to communicate from the get-go as soon as a child has a concussion. The most important thing that a parent can do is notify the school. The literature tells us that there is a lack of processes and communication in place between healthcare providers, school staff, and families after all severities of traumatic brain injury. If a parent doesn't notify the school that a concussion happened, and if the student isn't a student athlete or the athletic trainer knew about the concussion, 
the school may have no idea that a student had a concussion. So identification is the first thing that needs to happen. Next, the parent should sign release forms with the school nurse. So the school nurse can speak with the healthcare providers if the student is seeing a healthcare provider. Along with the school nurse, teachers have an important role to play. It's important they understand students with a concussion likely need accommodations while they recover. Accommodations should be aligned to a student's specific symptoms. Common accommodations schools can provide include, but are not limited to, assigning a peer to take notes for the student, reducing assignments to only essential work, allowing additional time for assignments, allowing students to take frequent breaks or scheduled naps in a nurse's office, dimming the lights, and allowing students to wear sunglasses or headphones. If your child's had a concussion, if your school does not have any kind of concussion management team in place, a parent can um, do a quick Google search. There are a lot of academic supports listed. The CDC has a lot of good ones. One is called Tips for Teachers After Concussion, and it lists basic academic supports that a school, a teacher can implement. And the purpose of that is you want, when a student comes back to school, you don't want to front load them with all of the academic thinking demands because that will spike symptoms. Instead, the school should put some supports in place such as um, build in a few breaks into the student's day. If you can borrow a student's notes, borrow someone else in your class, get their notes, make copies of them. Anything you can do so that you don't have to overload yourself. When your brain, when you start to feel symptoms, it's your brain's way of saying, you're doing too much right now. I'm trying to recover. Back off. So that's what I tell students. When you start to have symptoms, slow down. What can you do? to make things easier on yourself. So things like that cut back on the amount of cognitive load or exertion that the student has, and hopefully that can keep them under their symptom threshold. So we can keep them in school, in the learning environment, rather than spiking a migraine by noon because they've been thinking so hard, and then they have to go home every day. Juliana understands balancing that threshold all too well. Her symptoms drastically affected her ability to participate in class. I would feel the best in the mornings. I'd wake up with a dull headache that was kind of in the back of my skull, something that you'd have if you were dehydrated. And then the minute I made the quarter mile walk from my dorm to class, that dull headache would be throbbing already, kind of that feeling where you could feel like your heart beating in your head. And when I was in the classroom, there were moments where I would, you know, I would actually zone in for about 10 minutes and I, my best example is organic chemistry. I'd be there and then I would like 10 minutes just feel a sharp pain. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be lasting, but just a sharp pain that would just take me out and I couldn't zoom back in. Like, cause I, I just had felt that like stabbing pain and immediately started to think about everything, but the problem on the board. You might not have had any symptoms at home while you were resting, but suddenly your symptoms are spiking and it's making you hard, you know, making it hard to learn, making it hard to read, to concentrate. If so, you should take a break. That's why we always encourage schools, let the student build in, you, the staff, build in the break for the student so that that student doesn't have to be the one to determine when they take a break because if you leave it up to the student, they're typically going to take a break when they're already symptomatic. And we want to prevent that if possible. You know, I was going to classes because I felt obligated to, but my, I wasn't present for most of it. There were moments where I was just gripping my chair um, in pain or to prevent nausea to kind of ground me. I felt like I couldn't remember things like I used to. So for exams, I would study for a week and then test myself and feel like I hadn't studied at all. The consistent pain became too overwhelming for Juliana. When it set in that she was not getting better, she looked for professional help. I sought out physical therapy because it was the quickest um, treatment I could start. Uh, seeing a neurologist can sometimes take a while to see a specialist. And that was really helpful in my vision and which decreased my headaches when I helped my vision. And we just did a lot of spatial therapy. So recognizing how close things are, how far things are and focusing on objects 
And I was really have to say I was diligent about my home exercises because I knew that doing those could help me. Um, one of them was sticking a sticky note on the wall and then looking at the sticky note and then looking at another object and then looking back at that sticky note and then looking somewhere else in the room. And just that, again, recognizing, you know, focal points in space back and forth. Other ones involved focusing while walking around. So I would be cooking dinner and while walking to the pantry, I would try to just focus on my thumb in front of me. Going to PT and sticking to her exercises were instrumental to Juliana's recovery, but she also learned to make adjustments to her daily life to feel her best. I'd like every time I left my house every morning, I would make sure I'd have these four things. The first, I'd always wear noise canceling headphones, even if I wasn't playing music, because music sometimes was too much for me. And they are the little earbud ones, not the over the head ones. And I wore those 24 seven. If you saw me without those, I was going home to go get them. And it was really helpful to just muffle out all of the sound stimulation that was happening. Boston University is on Commonwealth Avenue. There's the T roaring by. There's thousands of students having conversations all the time. And I would even wear them in the classroom, but like they weren't the ones where you couldn't hear anything. So it would just lower the, the volume of the professor or a video that was playing to a more reasonable sound. So that was really helpful. The second was I purchased blue light glasses and that was really helpful for lectures because, you know, I can turn the blue light off on my computer, but that's not helpful when the screen above me is like blaring blue light. So that was something I wore every day. And if I, before I got those, I actually wore sunglasses. I know that's a kind of common thing and you look funny, but it was definitely helpful. The third thing I have, I used was a fidget cube, which eventually turned into a fidget ring. And those, when I, when I was just overwhelmed with like symptoms, whether it's nausea or a migraine or just I couldn't see, I would just focus on just that. Even if I was in the classroom um, or if I was walking down the street, being able to like narrow like my focus to just one object. And then the last thing is a phone. But I mean, everyone has their phone, but how I used it, I'd say, like if I was having I walked out of class just feeling dreadful. I would just call someone, my mom or a friend, not to talk about necessarily like, uh, wow, I'm having an awful day, but just to like have a conversation, say like, I'm not doing well right now. How is the weather in California or something just to take my immediate mindset off of, you know, I just sat through a class where I was just having a migraine. If you are the caregiver or loved one on the other end of one of those phone calls, it's critical you help the patient set realistic expectations for their recovery. The best way that parents and caregivers and family members can help support their loved one through the transition back to school is to educate themselves. Learn as much as you can about concussion. Understand concussion. Go online. There's a lot of information. Again, a quick Google search could pull up some basic screenings that they can do to identify, is the student experiencing some issues? They might have had previous depression and anxiety that is now exacerbated after their concussion, but we really try to get students back to school so that they can be in the environment with their friends. And we find that it's so important to tell students from both their parents and the school side, hit them with the message of, we, we don't expect this to last long, we are here to support you if it does last longer than a typical concussion. And there are things that we can do. You know, you won't be alone through this. Managing return to learn for students is a process that needs to be adapted based on their age and activities they're involved in. So elementary school is different. I think elementary school is much easier to manage because usually students have like one or two teachers and the demands that are placed on them for thinking are a lot less than a high school student or a college student. So elementary students tend to be easier to manage, but you have to think about when you're, when you're talking to them about their symptoms, you don't want to say, are you nauseous? Are you fatigued? Because they don't, might not know what that means. So you want to say things like, um, like our documents that we use with elementary schools, we gear them and say, you know, how does your, how does your tummy feel? Or do you feel wobbly? 
when you move your head or uh, back to, back and forth. So we ask them questions that are age appropriate. High school students, I feel the hardest students to manage are like 10th and 11th graders because so many of them are high achieving they are pulled from their sports that they don't want to be pulled from. All they want to do is get back and they want to push through their symptoms. They don't want to stop. They don't want accommodated. They don't want to do anything. They want to return to normal and keep pushing through. Returning to college with a concussion also comes with its own unique challenges. Letting those in your social and academic circles know what you're going through is key. College students are really, they have a hard time when they have concussions because harder than any other age of children, teenagers, because college students have such pressure on them at college. The academic load is heavy. Often they struggle af with their symptoms after a concussion. Every college has a disability support office. So my recommendation is always reach out to the disability support office on campus. Let them know you've had a concussion provide them with any medical documentation you might have. Some schools are better than others about this when working with concussions, but the schools, the universities who are, um, who've had training in concussion and understand it, their disability support office will often help the student with academic accommodations for their classes with their professors. If you don't wanna go that route, at least let your professor know what has happened. Most professors are understanding. Like your teachers really want, most teachers really, really want you to do well in their, your class and your boss needs you to do well to, um, for you to be a good employee and for him to get his work done. So they are m much more forgiving when you say, I too want to get my work done and this is how I'm going to do it. It's just going to be a little different. So I think both the teachers and your your bosses are really rooting for you to get your work done and so how it's going to happen might have to change and i think people will be flexible but i i first and foremost had to say i can finish this work just not in the given hours that i used to do it and having that conversation where i was like i will still complete all the tasks assigned for me on monday by the following monday but that might require me to do two hours on tuesday because i have you know, two classes on Tuesday, but on Thursday I have no classes so I can get four hours in. And just having that time, having that reassuring him that I will still complete all the tasks I needed to, um, just at a different time scale than I had in the past was really important because if I didn't like assure him of that, then, you know, I, my job is at risk. When I worked in consulting and was the employee dealing with concussion symptoms myself, I had to be upfront and honest with my employers and let them know that I couldn't work nine to five and a 40 hour work week at the same level I could before. We came to an agreement that I would only be paid hourly and only had to work the hours I felt good enough to work. And it was the best choice for me and the best choice for the company. And soon enough, I was able to scale back up to a full-time position. And while Juliana was up front with her employer and her professors, she wishes she had shown that same transparency to her friends during the recovery process. So if I could go back, I think I would really try to tell my friends how they could help me because, you know, none of them had gone through this. So I wish I could go back and say, I'm, if I'm having a migraine, just like give me a hand to squeeze because it really hurts. Or if I had a bad exam, don't tell me, oh, you can just blame it on your concussion because that's not what I want to hear. So having that conversation with them and saying like, these are things that will help me when in those moments would be something I would wish I could go back and do because I really didn't communicate too much about my injury. I told you I brought my phone around, but it wasn't to talk about my head. It was to, you know, distract myself. So would recommend informing people around you how they can help you. The ups and downs of Juliana's experience back in the classroom after her concussion shows the importance of seeking care immediately and working with your doctors on an individualized plan. But in general, Dr. Egan Johnson likes to tackle the return to learn process in four week chunks. The first four weeks, we want the schools to, to not over support them, but to support them more than they normally would moving forward beyond four weeks. Once a student has gone beyond four weeks, start introducing things back in, start introducing um, more work, more repetition. 
If a student hits that four-week mark and still seems to be crashing every day, it's a good time to check back in with their provider and support team at school to explore other resources and strategies. You want to find out, is the student, what symptoms are they still having? If a student tells me that they are having headaches, I want to know in what environment. You want to drill down to try to figure out, are they having headaches because just they're getting headaches now? Or is it because it's afternoon and they're exhausted? Or is it because they might have a, an ocular vestibular issue going on that's making the lines jump around for them when they read? And one thing that I often identify in students is suddenly they'll be tracking when they read with their finger. And I say, have you always done that? No, but it's easier for me now to read if I do that. Well, that could signify that there's something going on um, you know, that's making them feel off balance, maybe making their eyes, they could have a convergence insufficiency issue. A lot of students who haven't recovered may need to be evaluated by a concussion clinic for not only vestibular therapy, but cognitive rehabilitation therapy. And that's different than cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive rehab, rehabilitation therapy is more um, focused on executive functions. So short-term memory, speed of processing, organization. So there are therapies available to help students. But at the school level, talk to the school. If you're a parent, talk to the school. My child still isn't recovered. My child's still struggling with homework. My child, let them know everything. And then there are options, legal options educationally, such as a 504 plan is something commonly recommended for students who are struggling and have a substantial impact. And the key there for a 504 plan, which provides a student with academic accommodations, is they have to be, the concussion has to be substantially impacting a major life function. That could be thinking, reading, concentrating, sleeping. And schools know what 504 plans are. A student may need something more significant. So on down the road, if maybe a student's concussion hasn't recovered and it's you know, three months, six months later, if they are substantially struggling in school, it may be important for them to be evaluated for possibly special education. Now, I have never, in all my years to date, I've never seen a student with just one concussion in their whole history needs special education services because of that one concussion. However, I have seen it frequently with students who have multiple concussions. It didn't happen overnight, but Juliana eventually got to a point where her symptoms weren't dominating her every thought and move. I think I didn't recognize I was feeling better at all until I was feeling significantly better. And then I looked back and realized, wow, a week ago, I was feeling actually X amount of better than I was the week before. So, but when I was finally able, finally feeling close to normal, I realized that I was not bothered when I had my headphones out for a period of time, or I was just went to multiple classes and then went to work. And then I, I got home and I realized, wow, I did all that <laughs> and like pat myself on the back because it wasn't a moment where I, I woke up and I was like, today is the day that I feel great. It was more I would finish the day feeling better and realizing that I had made it through more tasks I had today than the day before. And that kind of continued until I was really back to where I was. You can get there too. And just remember, concussion recovery does not happen in a straight line. The ups and downs are normal. A lot of people think that concussion is a, you'll see a lot of step-by-step. First you do step one, then you do step two. But what you're not hearing is that it's not a linear process. Sometimes you take a step forward and you go two steps back. So for some students, it is going to take them longer to recover. They may be a week in and suddenly be experiencing tons more symptoms. So, you know, you just have to kind of go with the flow, have open communication with your school, open communication with your healthcare provider. With the benefit of hindsight, Juliana knows how she would have handled things differently, and she hopes you'll learn from her missteps. I really wish, looking back, that I could tell myself on that Monday after I saw the school nurse that you need to take a week off right now. And I know that if I had done the uh, five days of, you know, relaxing at home and ordering food and not going to the store. I really think my recovery would have been significantly 
quicker or my symptoms would not have gotten as, you know, bad as they did. I really believe that. And I wish someone had really sat me down and said, no, you're not going to class today. So if you are the person, um, set yourself down and don't do it. If you are the loved one of a person, they're going to probably push back against you, but really it's for their health or your own health, whichever the situation is. So no one really ever told me, and I really think is incredibly powerful, is how you will alarm, like surprise yourself with how strong you were to get through it and do everything. Um, because you think of you making it to one class out of four as, as it might be like a failure, but you made it to one class with a concussion while everybody else there was just doing it because on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think I walked away from my recovery feeling like I could take on more things than I had before because heck, if I could do organic chemistry with a head injury, then I can do anything, right? Like I, I can get through a lot more. So I think, you know, that's the best thing. I walked away so much more confident in myself and my ability to be, you know, persistent and like tenacious. It's so true. Life is hard enough, but just getting through the day to day with a concussion deserves tremendous kudos. We are stronger and more resilient than we can ever give ourselves credit for. A huge thank you to Dr. Brenda Egan Johnson and Juliana Kalia for sharing their tremendous wisdom in this episode of Concussion Game Plan. If you have more questions about returning to learn after concussion or want to get more involved with us at CLF, check us out at concussionfoundation.org. If you like what you heard today, please leave us a five-star rating and review to help us reach someone else in their concussion recovery. Coming up in our next episode, we're focusing on return to play. Hear from Dr. Barry Jordan about the safest way to get back to your sport. Plus, Beach Volleyball National Champion Julia Scholes shares a cautionary tale about what can happen when you don't follow concussion protocols. She has a hopeful message we can all feel inspired by. Until then, I'm Dr. Chris Nowinski. Keep fighting.